going to go first. You're, yeah, I'm just going to make sure everyone's there. All right. You already got a mic, right? Yeah, I've got one, yeah. And that should be on, I think. Cool. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone's got the lead. Yep. Mm -hmm. Welcome, how are you? Is there any... Some pizza. Oh, I was going to say, oh, okay, yeah. But it's not, it wasn't his priority. I didn't know if it was, so yeah. I was careful. Right. I, I could hear, you know, noises coming out of the film playing there. So yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unless he got me when I peed, but. <laughs> yeah, it mutes on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Good? Okay. Testing one, two, three. You can hear me? Okay. Hi folks, so hello and welcome to the Gruber Sandbox at the FAU Libraries. My name's Mahesh Nilakanta, and I'm the IT Director here at the University Libraries. And I'm speaking here really on behalf of our Dean, Dr. Linda golian Louie. Uh, she's already got a prior engagement and she couldn't make it, so she sends her apologies, but you know, I was glad you guys are here. Uh, you're standing in what used to be our technical services area of the library. Over here, we used to process incoming books and journals before they headed out into our shelves. We have shifted most of our resources, as with many other academic libraries, to electronic availability. You might have checked out books electronically, journals, all those resources. And we also have interlibrary loan, which a lot of people use. Though we still purchase libraries and books, and you can see some in the back there. If you haven't, definitely go check out some AI-related books over there. But through a series of serendipitous events uh, and support from the College of Science and the University Libraries, and most importantly through its namesake, Dr. I mean, uh, Ruben Gruber, his, this place has been converted into one of the nation's first multidisciplinary artificial intelligence labs located in the university library. The Sandbox is a collaborative, experimental space for students of all levels and from all disciplines. It provides the opportunity to directly engage with fast advancing field of artificial intelligence. And the library is pleased to partner with the College of Science, the MPCR lab, and the Center for Future Mind in bringing the field of AI to our students. We welcome you to come back after this to the library in the future, not only for our books, but also for some of our other resources, including our Jaffe Center for Book Arts, where you can find an old world printing press, and our recorded sound archives, which are, have been started, which had been started to digitize Jewish music from records and cassettes, but now also serves to digitize all types of sound recordings. We also have a rare book collection, including the Marvin and Sybil Weiner Spirit of America collection, which includes books, pamphlets, government publications, newspapers, serials, and includes rare works from as early as the 16th century. I'll pass the mic on now to Dr. Hahn, who will be speaking about AI in the sandbox, and I welcome you to come back and visit us again in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, welcome, everybody. Really glad you could join us this afternoon. Super excited to tell you what we've been working on. Um, I have up here an AI art generator. We'll pull this up at the end, so remind me. We'll, we'll come back to this one. But I have a bunch of fun slides. I wanted to kind of go through what we've been working on and what we've been thinking about here in our, in our lab. But I want this to be interactive, so just jump in and ask me questions. Or I, t I tend to go really fast. So if I go really fast, just slow me down. It's like, please go back a bit, right? So we like this term that we call brain science, with sort of the AI capitalized in the middle. Right? There's a lot that's happening in the world uh, in terms of artificial intelligence. And we think there's a sort of a, a long path in front of that, and we're really excited, but this is kind of just the beginning. And so we're encouraging you know, everybody to, to think about how you can get involved in this field. It used to be something that was sort of very obscure and very technical, and now it's sort of available to everybody. So I want to show some of the, the science stuff that we've been working on. Um, we have collaborations with the Brain Institute and the Center for Complex Systems. And what we try to understand is, is this object here, right? What you are, what we're all made out of, and sort of no small feat, right? We'll just sort of figure out the brain. We don't know how this thing works. There's nobody alive that knows exactly how this thing works. And we're trying to figure that out. And we focus primarily on using machine models to try to understand how this object works. And so if we peel off those outer layers, we can kind of make this thing see through. And we can look at the electrical activity. And this is the kind of data that you get from the MRI scanners, uh, like on the edge of campus here. So what we've been working on is trying to understand how those models work and how we can both understand the brain to make better machines and then how we can use machines to better understand the brain. 
So I like to go back to the beginning. This, this subject's not that old. And if we go back and we look, this Alfred Smee put this book out. Uh, he said electricity in biology was only about 100 years old at the time. And he said, why can't we understand this for uh, something like instinct and reason? Can we build an electrical model of the brain? And, and that's what they built. And so as you can see here, almost 180 years ago or so, we have this picture of skin, ear, and eye. And this, pa this network here goes in and it gets routed around this object here that we now call a neural network. So this funny little routing table that you see there is uh, one of the most popular and powerful objects on the planet right now, and it's called a neural network. Has anybody ever heard of this idea, the neural network? And so it started with this very simple diagram, and if you Google this concept today, you'll get a picture that looks very, very similar. And so it's extraordinary how, how old these ideas are. They've been here for a really long time, but we didn't have the computers to, to bring it all together. And that's what's changing, and that's what I want to kind of show you. So we want to build a model, a model like this. It's not the real brain. It's just a, sort of a, a, a simplified version of it so that we can kind of understand it. And so people tried to build these things out of circuits and make sort of little, little uh, the eyeballs, essentially, out of wires and, and little bits like that. And you can see early on, these computers were just enormous sort of spaghetti contraptions. And what's amazing is now they've just gotten so small. So even with this enormous computer that would have been the size of this room, they're pointing this big camera, Sesame Street style, you know, this experiment is brought to you by the letter C, right? And that, it could barely do that. And they were really excited if it was at that sort of like, you know, preschool level of understanding things. And so with over the last hundred years, that kind of understanding has gotten miniaturized and put into all these little chips. And that's what we're going to look at. So if we go back, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago still and look at John von Neumann, you know, he suggested we might need a new kind of math to, to look at these things. That we might need to go and look at neurology and look at the brain cells and see what they're actually doing and how they talk to each other to figure this stuff out. And so then uh, Alan Turing comes along and he says, well, why don't, rather than making a machine that's already smart, why don't we do this like we, we train, raise children or the way we would train an animal? We get something that doesn't really know anything in the beginning, but then we can give it feedback and help it learn. And that's really the idea behind the modern version of AI. So I thought this was neat, going back to 1925, this idea of a little walking beetle. And so I find out we have a little toy car. Uh, Matt, see if you can help me find it somewhere. And uh, we started our, our laboratory with this little sort of toy beetle, essentially. And um, we got it to drive itself around, and we put a little brain in it. Here's a video of what that looks like in 1951. So that's basically a Roomba without the vacuum. <laughs> All it does is sort of just bounce around the room, and you can see he's showing it the flashlight and so on. Thank you, Matt. And so this is our little uh, mechanical beetle that we started our, our research lab with. And you can see it's got a little camera, and it's got a little antenna. And this is before self-driving cars were already on, on the road. And so we thought, well, let's turn this into essentially a little lab rat, a little experimental model that we can, we can test. And it's not like a real animal, but it allows us to sort of model those situations in a way that's more practical. And that's kind of what one of these contraptions looked like. You can see they had these giant light bulb looking components called vacuum tubes. And so it was very uh, expensive and elaborate to build these kinds of things. And now you, know, you can literally get this kind of stuff at the mall and we can do these kinds of experiments. And so Turing here said, why don't we build an electronic brain? If we want to build a thinking machine, why don't we put a camera and a microphone and loudspeakers and just make something that can kind of run around and experience the world? And so that's the kind of artificial life that we've been trying to build in the lab now. You might have heard of someone called Claude Shannon. He invented the idea of the bit, right? You've heard of gigabits and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he, he, he built this mechanical maze. Sorry, the video has all these artifacts in it. Let's see if I can just pause it here. But what he's showing is a little mechanical mouse and a little maze and this elaborate computer, which was you know, like the size of this TV thing, but is a big box. And inside there were a bunch of mechanical switches and relays. But this mouse could learn to run that maze, right? And this is a very long time ago. Okay, so uh, all the way back in 56, people said, why don't we start simulating brain cells? If we want to build one of these things, why don't we do that? And so Arthur Samuel here, he set out an experiment to simulate these brain cells and simulate a learning machine to get him to win, to beat him at checkers. Now, that's a pretty kind of wild thing to do. How do you beat yourself at something? That's like hiding from yourself in hide and go seek. Anywhere you would think to hide, you would also know to look there, right? So it's how do you get away from yourself? But amazingly, the power of machine learning, in the end, it was able to beat him at checkers. So he got the machine to do something that he can't do himself. Right. 
So uh, in the 50s, this was called artificial intelligence. The person who coined that name said he just made it up for a grant. And so he said, don't think anything too much in it. Right? He just sort of made it up. And then in the 80s, they started to call this machine learning. And we use this to separate your emails and things like that and filter them out. And then the big deal, what they call deep learning now, is when the computers finally got big enough to hold entire photographs. So I don't know if you, a lot of you probably remember when computers couldn't hold music and they couldn't hold movies and it just didn't fit. There wasn't enough space on the computer. And now computers have enough memory that we can load to thousands and literally millions of images if we need to. And so this is what these things look like. You train it with cats and dogs. Uh, we'll take a look at it. And then you give it a new picture that it's never seen before and you hope that it can identify it as a cat. Now why is it they were able to do this all of a sudden that we couldn't do this before? So here we have a, a timeline. We have year down here. And here it says calculations per second for constant dollar. So you fix for inflation, so the money's the same. And then you basically, I'm going to give you $1,000 and you go out and buy the best computer you can buy. And then I want to know how many math problems a second that new computer you just bought can do. And if we go back here, you know, to the 1950s, we had these enormous computers that were the size of this room and they cost a fortune. And now if we look all the way up here in the corner, these are the computers that we have back there. So for the price, these are the fastest computers in the world. Here's that similar diagram. This one is, was put out by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. We have four students, very proud, four students are, are there now working. And you can see what they're, what they're talking about doing is simulating the human cortex. Right? And so this graph is actually from 1998. And this scientist, Hans Moravec, said, well, we need to kind of predict when we're going to get enough computing power to simulate things like spiders and lizards and mice. And our idea is, wow, we're, we're here now. We live in 2023, and if we go up here to the graph, we see that we have a fast enough computer that in the 90s they said, when we get those computers, we should be able to simulate mice. Ooh. And so that's what's really exciting about how, how fast these things can go. They could do things we wouldn't have considered doing before. So in 85, this was the fastest computer in the world. NASA used this to design the space shuttle, and it was their digital wind tunnel. Nowadays, that computer, that computer costs $16 million. You can buy a Raspberry Pi computer for $38, and that one has twice as much memory as the Cray computer. Right? If you go over to Whole Foods and you get two ras actual Raspberry Pis, it's probably going to cost about that much. Right? And so <laughs> something has really happened that we've never seen anything like in the world get that cheap that fast. Right? In 97, this was the fastest computer in the world. You can see it was the size of a tennis court. It was 10,000 computers all hooked together. The energy of 800 houses. 800 houses, right? Green AI is a big deal nowadays. They talk about you know, lowering the electrical footprint. And it cost $55 million. Right? Up top it says 1.8 teraflops. That means 1.8 trillion math problems every second. And hard math problems, like 3.1657 times 8.32215, you know, stuff like that. How many of those can you do in one second? I can't do any of those in one second, right? <laughs> the computers behind you are 10 times faster than that. 10 times faster than the fastest computer in the world in 97. That means they would be a half a billion dollars, but that computer didn't have the internet, right? So we're in a whole new era. So think of the problems that we had in 97 that you wanted a supercomputer for, climate, healthcare, whatever it might be, we now have these supercomputers and you can basically run them. So there's a computer that's twice as, 10 times faster. You can see the little car there in the background and driving that around. <laughs> why, why is this possible? Well, uh, this guy Steve here, he worked at Kodak. And in the 70s, he went up to his bosses and he says, I've invented a new camera. It runs on electricity. And they said, Steve, we make all of our money selling ink and paper. We don't want anything to do with this. Go away. So uh, it was this big contraption. It took 0 0.01 megapixel, black and white, 23 seconds to create one image, and it put on these tapes. But obviously, nobody was interested. Um, now, in the 50s, if you wanted to move five megabytes of data, you needed a forklift and an airplane. Right? How many iPhone photographs can you fit in five megabytes? Not even one. Not even one. So in this entire computer disk, you would not be able to fit even one iPhone photograph. You'd fill up the whole thing. 
that you could fit just the top corner of a picture. Now, that five megabytes turned into 128 megabytes, and rather than being $120,000, it was suddenly $99. $99. But then a short nine years later, this went from megabyte to gigabyte. That's an improvement of 1,000 at the same price. The same price. What does 1,000 times cheaper mean? 1,000 times cheaper means a million dollar house is 1,000 bucks. It means a new sports car is the price of a tank of gas. Right? That's crazy. You want a million dollar house? Just wait nine years. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing like that has ever happened. If we look at what happened, you'd all have these cameras probably in your pocket right now. They're a billion times better. They got a thousand times better picture, a thousand times lighter, a thousand times cheaper. We've never had anything like that happen in history. So other kind of cameras are getting almost nearly as good. Here is the patent for the very first MRI picture. Uh, these are the types of scanners we have on the edge of campus. Uh, I think I got the other picture in here somewhere. And uh, these are the kinds of things that you want to go and take a picture of, of all of your, uh, in, in everything, everything you can, right? But now that's too much data. If you go down to a radiologist and you say, I want to get a head-to-toe scan, they won't do it. You can't afford it. Take them 10 minutes to look at each slice. There's a, you get a slice for every millimeter you are tall. They don't have the time. You don't have the, the money to pay them to do that. So what we need to do is to build an AI system that can go through and tag all of these things just like we tag Facebook pictures. Imagine trying to do Facebook in the 80s. Right? It's sort of like a volunteer thing with like push pins and, and you know, Polaroids and stuff like that. And you'd be like, oh, it's little Jimmy. And like you'd circle the faces and volunteers recognizing people. It would never work. Right? It, would, it would, could never possibly work. Here's that first picture that came out of the MRI machine. It took four hours to get that picture. You can see 1977. You don't have to be a physician to know there's not really much diagnostic. You know, you're not going to learn anything from that picture. But, but nowadays, you can get very high resolution pictures that look like this. And so now it's over, almost overwhelming how much detail you get. Right? Should it be this way? Should you have a branch there? What, what do these pieces all, all mean? We want to be able to go get head to toe scans, but we need to have something that can analyze all of that data and, and keep track of it for us. So if we look at this explosion of data, it's not just in healthcare, but it's just on the internet in general. So you can see here this exabyte, 83 exabytes. Is a, the EB stands for a billion gigabytes. And in 2016, already 83 billion gigabytes went across the web every month. And uh, if we look at what's happening here, we now have 300 million images a day. And this is out of date, right? This is way more than this now. But already we were seeing things like 72 hours per minute at YouTube. Right? So imagine your job is to look for copyright music at YouTube. And so you, you start Monday morning and you watch your first you know, minute of the first video and now you're 72 hours behind, right? the first minute in. So these kinds of tasks, we can't do them uh, by hand. And so we need something called computer vision. Right? So what is computer vision? Well, you're familiar with cameras. Cameras take us from physics to images. They turn light into images. Then we know what image processing is. That's when you run like a filter on your picture. You take a picture and you get another picture. Graphics is where we take words and symbols and we turn them into pictures. And then computer vision is the opposite. We take a picture and we turn it into a symbol. We want to know what that thing is in there that we see. So here's what I call the hardest problem in the world, sorting out pictures of cats and dogs. And, and, and you laugh, but as recent as 2007, 2008, there wasn't a computer on the planet that could accurately sort out pictures of cats and dogs. Right? That sounds pretty crazy. Little kids can do this, no problem. Why couldn't we get a machine to do that? Right? Why is that so difficult? So that's what the big breakthrough with AI is. And what's so interesting is if you can get a machine that can do the cat and dog problem, that problem is so difficult that things like cancer and Alzheimer's and anything else you want to look for is basically easy at that point. It's no more difficult than looking at for a cat or a dog. So why is this hard? Why is this hard for a computer? So here's what data looks like. Here's just some random data that we're going to present to the machine. And we're going to get to see why is it difficult for the machine to understand. Uh, so it kind of looks like uh, maybe you flew a drone through the Grand Canyon, or maybe you took an underwater rover by the Gulf Stream and looked for underwater sea vents or something like this, a mountain range or a forest. But it's not. This is a photograph. This is an ordinary photograph. It's not a 3D camera. It's not a special camera. It's a black and white image. You've seen it before. It's the very first one that popped up on Google. So I just picked that one. You're going to recognize it in a second. It'll go to the right angle, and your whole brain will snap in, and you'll go, wow. 
So that's been there the whole time. So when we ask a machine to say, is this a cat, is this a dog, is this a person, is this a smile, it's, this is why it's difficult, right? Because that shows us how difficult it is for the machine, essentially. So this is the thing we're trying to understand. We're trying to model the, the bit that you just saw when it finally got to the right angle, all of this you know, machinery in your head activated, and you say, oh, I know what this is. So how do, we, how do we build that into a machine? And that's what we try to model. We try to model these simple brain cells, and we build simulations of uh, visual cortex, and we show it different inputs, and we see how does this sort of mathematical brain respond to these images. And if we do this in, in a series of layers, just like our brain does, then ultimately we can decide what it is that's in that photograph. Right? We can pull this out and we can build these sort of image classifiers. Skip that. So we can do all kinds of really amazing experiments nowadays. And so this subject used to be very technical, and now it's getting very easy to use. There's cloud tools, and no matter what your background is, you don't have to code at all. Um, you know, part of our, our, our goal here is to bring people into this material even if they have no background in it. That's kind of the whole idea. Um, my, my physics professors used to say the best preparation for physics is never having had physics. Because you, you don't have to unlearn the old stuff. So uh, if you, if you want to learn AI, the best preparation for that is not knowing anything about it. Uh, but here you can see we can track you know, the, the fruit fly or a cheetah or the hands or whatever it is, horses or something like that. We could put all of these things. Now, historically, you'd have to have like a clipboard and volunteers and you know, freeze frame photography. And it would just be really expensive, right? Or just really time, time laborious. And nowadays, we can, we can just track this thing. We say, well, how fast does it wiggle? How much does it move in a day? All kinds of really interesting questions that would have just been really prohibitively difficult to gather before. So here you can see the, the whisking behavior on the mouse there, tracking individual whiskers. And then you can see, as we put like an object there, whiskers are not just, you know, uh, it's not just a mustache. They, they're, it's an active thing that they use to, to look at the environment and all that, so we can study those kind of behaviors. Uh, here we can see mo modeling a human as they use tools. We want to understand, do people consider that tool part of their hand? How do they adapt to that, that tool use, that sort of thing? Uh, you can track a whole bunch of fish to look at swarm behavior. Here's looking at bugs and animals overhead, things like that from the wild, from drones. Let's see where we're at. Uh, this is one that we uh, collaborated with Max Planck to work on, and this is what they call serial block face scanning electron microscopy. And so this is an impossibly small piece of a fruit fly's eye here, and it's just a couple, I mean, just like nanometers across the whole thing. When they shave this layer, when they see that microtome go across, you're shaving off just a couple nanometers off that thing. Um, it's, it's, almost it's almost hard to imagine how, how small that is. And so you go through it, and you scan that with an electron microscope, and you get that picture, and then we want to go through and organize all that data, sort of count things and see what we found. And so you get sort of a, a picture like this if we move through the, the stack as we go. And then we want to identify all the organelles and the cell membranes and stuff. So you can kind of see how overwhelming, let me pull this one up, sort of how much data, you know, I'm just going to skip through here. But you can see it just zooms in and zooms in and zooms in. There's just so much sort of at the bottom that we want to kind of uh, catalog and figure out how it's all connected. Oops. Okay, so what we do is we, we go to the, uh, you either get some graduate students or you get the, the, the scientists to, to label a few. The idea is we want to do some of the work to teach the AI what we want to do, and then we want the AI to take over. So we take this input, and then with like a marker, you can imagine taking a highlighter and going through and cutting out the, the, the cell membranes there. But it's not just as easy as taking the bits that are brighter and darker than the other, because there's these other structures here, uh, the organelles that you don't really want to include. So it, it can't just do it by the color. It has to look and consider it in more detail. So we paint a few of these, and then the idea is then that we can say to the AI, all right, now that you know what we're talking about, please go through and sort of carve these things out. And so here we can see a couple neurons, and you can see where they're, where they're talking to each other. And then so we can zoom in here. Right? You can see for a second, you'll see the, the vesicles with the neurotransmitters are over here. And so when we're trying to understand or, or create therapeutics, understand Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, we want to know how these things are actually wired up and what they do. And so that's what this sort of AI is, is allowing us to do, is sort of go through and pick apart all these, all this massive amount of data. Okay, so I'll skip some of these. We've got a bunch of this stuff. Uh, 
We can watch these things blink over time. So something called optogenetics, where we can actually get these neurons to fire light when they, when they are activated, and then we can measure that with a camera. So this idea of using a camera and pointing it at science experiments, I think, is really just at the early stages. Here we can watch them all blink and see when they synchronize and all kinds of cool stuff like that. Uh, I'll skip that one. Uh, we get these incredible imaging where you can sort of stain the living organism and then watch it, you know, create this full animation and sort of th see through N3D. Um, they, you know, this will allow us to ask questions and answer questions about biology that we couldn't possibly do before. So we're gonna need massive, massive data sets to analyze these. We wanna think about the VR headsets that we can go through and look at all of this stuff in 3D and try to understand exactly what's happening. All right, let me skip some of these so we can get to the, the art generator. This one's uh, really cool. If anybody's ever done micro a regular light microscopy, you know that like, there's, certain, uh, there's a narrow focus. Oops. I don't need the sound. And it's hard to focus on the entire cell, right? You look at the top and you can't see the bottom. You look at the bottom, you can't see the top. So what we can do with deep learning is go through and label all of these together and make this really cool kind of 3D model of the whole thing. You know, normally we think of cells, we see the cells as circles, but really they're like water balloons. And so this actually allows us to see them really in their sort of full 3D shape. Right? So this sort of, you know, what started as just simply let's sort out cats and dogs has so quickly grown into this thing where we could sort out nuclei and DNA and membranes and everything else. And, and thankfully it's not any harder than the cats and dogs. But there you can see they almost look like eggs in an egg crate or something like that. And so you can actually see the the bubble aspect of the cells and, and watch them all move around. So if we're trying to understand something like, you know, tumor growth, this could be really invaluable model to do that. Okay, let's, let's skip some of the, some of these and just some of the fun stuff. Um, okay, so I want to show you some of the fun stuff that you can do with this. You can sort of take, um, you take a folder of zebras and a folder of horses and you ask the AI, please figure out what the difference is and Photoshop one into the other. And it eventually will learn what the differences are and it will remove, you can see this one was a zebra and it sort of photoshopped the stripes out automatically. And then this one was a horse that automatically added zebra stripes. Right? Now that would have been very painstaking to do by hand. Who sees what's wrong with it? What's that? Striping lots of stuff, what else? Yeah, they're not in a pattern. Yeah, what, what about it? They're moving. <laughs> the stripes don't move, right? The stripes should be a sort of a steady pattern and the horse should just move. Yeah. The tail has too many stripes, exactly. <laughs> and then if you notice real quickly, uh, right here, it puts stripes on the fence, <laughs> right? So it doesn't really know what it's doing. It's just doing the best that it's so far that you've asked it to do. This one's really fun. This is sort of an AI assisted drawing tool. So I have the artistic ability like you see here on the left. And then what you can do is just hit the buttons and then this will give you all kinds of different versions of that depending on the scenery you want. Now this is exciting because this makes available whole new sets of careers. Or maybe you're not a graphic artist, but maybe you wanted to, to produce a play or a backdrop or an album cover or whatever it is. Now you can start thinking about you know, making these things yourself. We can take photographs and turn them into different painting styles. So you can put the different painters up here and then you say, please render this photograph in that style. I think this is really exciting. If you're an artist, you might want to do a bunch of studies and see which ones you really like and then spend a few weeks actually painting that one. These people aren't real. That doesn't make any sense, right? It's easier for my brain to make up a fake reality for these people. I, I, it's easier, I'd rather just like make up a name and pretend they're this and that and they do this than to, to wrap my head around the fact that they're not real, they've never existed. There might be by chance somebody that happens to look like them, but the computer made them up from scratch. Here's, uh, here's some fake celebrities. They look vaguely familiar because they're kind of mixtures of people you might recognize, but, but they're not real, they don't exist. That's a funny sort of notion. Um, so not only can we, can we uh, just make random things, we can ask for what we want or we can, we can ask it to describe it. So here we give it a photograph and the AI system will say this is a blue and yellow train traveling down the train tracks. And so it doesn't just know there's a train, it can sort of describe it in a, in a larger context. And so for the visually impaired, this is a, this is a real breakthrough, right? Because now we can have just a, a sort of seeing eye glass and just take it around and have it run stuff. What's, what's even wilder than that is we can I'll run this backwards as I'm sure you've seen by now, that we can take these and say, please give me a certain art of a certain style 
or we can even prompt it. We can say, give me a, a capybara animal, and then you can say, put it in all of these different styles. Right? And so you get all these different kind of paintings, and you can ask for hundreds and hundreds of those at a time. We can give it really strange prompts, like an astronaut lounging in a tropical resort you know, in a vaporwave style, and it knows what that means. It knows what those words mean, and it knows what that should look like in some sense. Um, we could say, I want teddy bears working on new AI research in the moon in the 80s. And so it, has, it knows what teddy bears are, it knows what the moon is, it knows what 80s technology looks like. Or we could say, no, no, put them underwater with 90s technology. Right? <laughs> now, what's really neat is it put the bubbles here and stuff like that. The bubbles are going up. You see like the specular reflections and all that. That's, that's physics, right? It learned that bubbles go up. Nobody told it that this is how water works and that when people ask for water, this is what we want you to show. No, it just kind of learned that concept just by seeing all the different examples. And then I'll just leave you with this one. It's one of my favorites. What you do is you, you give it the list of ingredients, butter, shortening, egg, salt, vanilla, baking powder, and so on, and it tells you a picture of what the, the dish will look like if you were to make that. Right? So it's seen so many recipes on the internet, and it's seen the instructions for the recipe, and it's seen the final picture of the recipe, that it can guess what the dish will look like simply from the list of ingredients. Right? You sort of recognize the thing. So that's artificial neural networks. And so I want to thank everybody for coming by the Sandbox today. I want to invite you all to, to join our research. We have open lectures um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we're here all the time to just come by and, and say hello, whoever's here, and we'll get you involved in, in some of this research. So I'd love to take questions, and if you want, we can pop over here and, and run some of the, the art generator. You guys can put some stuff in. So questions real quick? All set? All right, well, then I need a prompt. Who's got a prompt for the, uh, the image generator? Run for just a second. We need the Jeopardy music, right? I was thinking. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So we should have ten of them here. Let's see if we can. Oh, I don't know. Let's put outer space, right? Something like that. Yeah. Let's put. Um... And so this is kind of the, the fun thing now, and this is what they call prompt engineering. And this is one of the biggest exciting kind of careers now in some sense. And I, when I first heard about it, I thought that was like a, a meme career. Like, oh yeah, but that's not, it's not really a thing you could be or whatever. But no, there's actually like job postings and job listings, very high end, uh, high paying jobs. And they want people who know how to work with these things to get what you want. Some of these are cool, I like this one. So we can open this in a new tab. Wow, that's kind of cool. Wow. I mean, I have no doubt that these would have won, you know, contests in the, in the 80s and 90s kind of thing. And then the, the, the fun thing is we can just run that again and get a whole nother set. So I'll leave that one there so we have those. Let's just, let's just run the same prompt again and we can get more. So it's set up so that it will not duplicate It's not, not going to give you the same thing twice, no. And what's really extraordinary is like these are not photoshops. They're, you know, one thing you think it could, you can imagine a computer program that could go out and get a picture of space and then go out and get a picture of books and sort of glue the p books on top of the space and say, here you go, we asked for. But it's not doing that, right? It really is making them up as we go. <laughs> oh, this one's kind of cool. All right, who's got another prompt? Great prompt. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. This is a big issue. This is a big issue, and people are, people are quite upset about it. Um, so the, Im the images it's making are an amalgam, in some sense, of everything it's seen. But it's seen so many things that it's hard to pinpoint where it got the idea. Uh, but what some people are concerned about is you can put in particular artists. And we can say, ask me if we're a painting by such and such, and it will make one like that. Now, most of those folks aren't around anymore, but some of the folks are and they still actively have careers in art. And so I, th I think this is gonna be a big issue. One of the things that we're, we're developing is a, is a math algorithm to take the picture and, and watermark it, to hide another picture. Not like the, the watermarks on top where it just like kind of ugly, you know, messes up the picture, but one that's invisible 
but if someone were to get that picture later, they could know who it came from and when they made it and why they made it and anything else they wanted to add on there. Um, I think this is going to be a, a big issue um, in terms of are they, is credit going to get back, both attribution but even financial credit. You know, this open AI company is making a lot of money now off of this kind of capability, so I think this is going to be a big issue. I think it's going to disrupt copyright in a lot of ways. I don't think we know how it's going to turn out, but um, it's you know something we definitely all need to be thinking about. All right, who's got? Yeah. This is sort of its cousin, right? So this is the image generator. It's called Dolly, right? Like the like the artist, and um, we can pull up the, the 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 chat bot is right here, so we can ask that a question. We're in, we're working in Python right now. Uh, sort of working directly with the, the AI engine, and we can ask it what we want, or we can say, I'll put in why is art important, and just run that, and it'll think for a second, and let's see what it says. So there we go. Provides a means of expression, allows us to explore and understand different cultures, encourages creativity, and provides emotional catharsis. So they got a whole thing, right? It's like it'll go on and on. And you could say, and you could say, go on. You could say, write me an essay about this. Uh, you could talk about the history of art, whatever it is that you, you wanted to do. Any other prompts you want to try? Or are we all too shy? So come on up to the keyboard after, and you can you can try some prompts, right? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for coming by, and uh, welcome to the sandbox. Come by, please, again soon. Of what in the style of Warhol? Of, of me? I don't think he would know what I look like, though. We can ask for something else. In the, I always like putting in. I put in M and M cookies. Let's see what he says. <laughs> so it's like the recipe one. Um, well, well, let's see. Uh, how do you spell Warhol? Does that look right? Yeah. It can fix it, yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of cool. They look like uh, Modrian there. Yeah. Right? Now let's um, pop art painting. So it knows different styles, right? So if we say, if we explicitly ask for pop art, right, we might get something that is a little closer. What's really wild is it knows a bunch of different artistic styles, right? Um, who's heard of a tilt shift photograph? That's where you sort of make stuff look tiny by using the focus. So let's ask, and who's heard of a color splash picture? That's when it's all black and white, but one part's in color. So let's ask for uh, a color splash, tilt, shift, photo. I can neither uh, spell nor type, so help me out here. Uh, color splash, tilt, shift, photo of Boca Beach. I'll put Boca with tags in there. Yeah. Okay, did I type that right? Let's see what it says. It knows. All right, let's ask it to, uh, who's got another one? I'll just I'll change this to Rio, see if it knows what Rio looks like. Famous things, yeah, it will know, yeah. So let's do the same thing, let's do... I know. Let's see. Let's make this bigger. I'm 
so there's going to be a lot of photographs like that on the internet, and so it'll have a lot of experience kind of thing. What's really fun is to ask it for things that like just kind of don't exist, like um, whale walking through the, um, you know, um, God. Right, so it'll just, it'll dream up things. It gets very creative. Not quite what I was thinking. <laughs> do the shopping mall? Yeah, let's do that. And if you're, and if you're clever, you can get it to really interesting things. Like one I saw was a swimming pool table. And it did a swimming pool, but it was also a pool table, and just, it was really wild. Uh, you said the mall? Okay, let's look at these real quick. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> wow. All right, here's another one. All right, well, I'll leave it open. You guys can come on up and try some. All right, well, thank you again. Appreciate your time today. Isn't that wild? Because I always wanted to do that, you know, because like you can't see the whole thing, and I always wanted to just like picture the whole thing. Yeah. So we have some microscopes over here that we're just getting set up. So if that's something y'all want to work on. Yeah. Oh, great. So tracking coral growth is like a, a really cool thing you can do with this. Yeah. So you can measure like how much it grows over time.